whenever you're ready, let's go ahead and kick off. All right. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to have uh, three really excellent horsewomen um, on this panel that I have known, starting with Sky, I've probably known her for a decade. Um, <laughs> um, that's morning side of venting. Um, and JJ Tate, who I've probably known about the same time, um, who is uh, JJ Tate Dressage, and she's just started this fantastic new program, the uh, JJ Tate, is it Academy? Yeah, JJ? It's, yep, it's the Team Tate Academy. Team Tate, sorry. And it's That's a okay. brilliant idea of how to train sort of long distance, especially during COVID, and get a lot of help, which people are in such desperate need because we can't always travel to get to our, our trainers. So I think that was a, an excellent, brilliant idea because <laughs> education is really important in all aspects of the sport. And last but certainly not least, my very good friend, Allison Cavey, who we have been <laughs> roommates in Florida in Wellington for I think seven years. When you live with somebody, you really get to know them. And I've been very privileged to not only get to know Allison as a person, but as a horsewoman. And she's she's top notch. She she like JJ and Skylar are true horsewomen. They're not just horse trainers. So with that introduction, ta-da! <laughs> um, we're gonna start with a, a, a more esoteric question. What are, the, what are some of the lessons that young horses have taught you? Let's start with Scott. Um, patience and being humble. It's a lot like raising my toddler. <laughs> I have a four-year-old daughter and there's good days and bad days. Um, but you know, with structure and positivity, you turn into a uh, well-rounded adult. <laughs> both the kids and the horses <laughs> um, but really it comes down to patience you know it's uh, the training process is slow and you have to accommodate every horse and every type of personality I love uh, I love that answer I that, <laughs> I don't I don't have kids <laughs> just just um, I definitely think young horses you know it's kind of been fun I've taken over riding one of my four-year-olds here and, you know, I ride a lot of upper level horses. And so then it's always like a big shift to like get on the baby horses. And, you know, it really just makes you so grateful that they let us get on them at all. And you just forget that like the trained horses, how much they've learned that, you know, you get on a youngster and, you know, sometimes you don't stay on the youngster and sometimes <laughs> you here. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it just makes you so grateful you know, for the journey that the other horses have given you. And I definitely think staying humble and um, yeah, listening to the horse, you know, my mentor, Charles DeComfy always talked about that the horse is your calendar and you, you know, can't make the horse fit into what you think they need to do. It's really about, you know, honoring each one and some grow, some take more time, some are more sensitive, um, some don't need to go to a horse. So some need to go to every horse show possible, <laughs> you know, so it's really fun to get to know them. But I definitely think, you know, staying humble and taking your time is also a huge part of it. Allison? Yeah, I mean, I think both of uh, my co-panelists made really excellent points there. I have the fun every day of getting on two horses who are coming into the Grand Prix now and all the way down to one that I'm backing now. So, and I try to do them in different orders every day. And one of the things I was just thinking about today, partially in preparation for the panel was how grateful I am for the young ones, because it's really nice to just be able to get on and say, hey kiddo, I just need you to trot, can you do that? And even if they're terrified of plants or Today, light was a big issue for a few of them because the uh, reflections were funny in my arena. But it was just so fun to find where they were and meet them there and see where we got in our time together. And that's what I love most about riding. And it's what I love most about the young horses. They always bring me back to the basic joy of 
rhythm and line and the pleasure of working with another being whose rhythm and line become your own. So I think that's, for me, the, the thrill and the enticement and the constant love affair with starting and restarting horses. So um, we've, we've had a lot of questions before the, the um, webinar. Um, and I tried to condense them into more of a cohesive subject, which is how do you go about creating a training program for a young horse? And sort of the subset of that is when do you ask for more and when do you back off? Skylar? You know, I do event horses and so a little different, I'm sure, than some of the dressage horses. We do a lot of off the track horses. Um, that's kind of our big thing at Morningside is we develop a lot of horses right from the track. So I think you have to listen to the horses. You have to understand where each horse is coming from. Um, we have a pretty systematic approach, but with a lot of variation in, as far as environments and diversity and what we're doing. So I actually do have a formula that I uh, give all of my students at Morningside Eventing, whether it's young horses or upper level horses. And this is more structured towards, towards eventing. Um, but we do a dressage day. We do a Cavaletti grid coordination day, um, a fitness day, which for young horses is not getting them super fit, but doing a lot of trotting, getting out into the cross country fields, um, kind of a more upper level dressage day based on like test work or what they're doing, um, a bigger jump day, and then we always hack. And, um, and then a day off. And that's kind of our formula here um, at Morningside. And then we are flexible and structure that towards what each horse needs and what each rider needs. Um, and then we listen to the horses. When they're offering more, we keep going. Uh, if they're setbacks, we always take a step back. And I think uh, every horse is a bit different there. What would be a typical setback? Um, for the racehorses, they're not always typical setbacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much baggage when you're coming off the track and, and I'm lucky to work with sport horses from a really good breeder too. Um, but I do a lot, as you know, Tigger of the off the track horses. Um, there's connection issues. They don't understand the bit. They don't know what the leg means. They come right off the track. Some have raced 60 times. Some have raced six times. Um, some have been claimed. Some have been in bad situations. Um, so we have to really make an individualized plan for each horse. And I will say most of our young horses are race horses right now. So it is a little bit different. I, I, I do, like I said, work for a breeder that, um, and I've backed and started from the ground up some really nice sport horses. And uh, still though, you have to listen to them. I have a very hot mare right now. Um, she's fabulous. Uh, she um, was doing the four-year-old Futurity for USEA for the event Horse Futurity last year. And uh, we found out she was pregnant. Oh. Didn't know at the time. Um, so uh, she's, back, that happens. Uh, she's back to me as a five-year-old. <laughs> and oh. so we're dealing with hormone issues um, and basically restarting her. So, you know, each horse has like a very different path and you really have to listen and, and pay attention to what each horse needs. JJ? Yeah, I, I love that answer, Skylar. And we definitely do really similar stuff. I would say with our young horses, um, both Ashley Perkins and Jessica Davis uh, do a lot of the young horse riding here as well. And, you know, Again, it's like, you know, we kind of try to keep the rule of three-year-olds go three times a week, four-year-olds go four times a week, and the five-year-olds go five times a week. And kind of the whole program sort of goes, you know, five days a week. Um, we really like to incorporate hacking. But of course, you know, with the young horses, I would say like our three-year-olds, while they're getting started, we actually sometimes um, during the starting process, we maybe work um, a smaller amount of time, but more often during the week, just to like, you know, get them familiar with everything. And then once they're being ridden and everything's established, then we try to back off because they're still like growing and, you know, try to give them as much turnout as possible. Unfortunately, um, my farm doesn't have a lot of big fields, but 
we are working on building more. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm a big fan of turnout. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of our young horses, we've got one three-year-old who came, started in January. He He's a stallion. He is like amazing. I mean, um, Arthur Greenwood and Jessica Greenwood own him and um, he it d doesn't really need to be lunged. He, he actually can go four days a week. I mean, she's probably on him 20, 25 minutes. He's already been to his first horse show. Um, my four-year-old uh, that I own with one of my best friends, uh, Michelle Miller, um, I have to lunge him every day before I get on. And like the outdoor is not yet safe to go out, <laughs> you know? So, you know, he needs more time. And I love to do you know, spend time with them on the ground. Um, you know, I've got some great uh, grooms, you know, that spend, you know, I've got a really good girl named Ashley and um, a new guy, Miguel, who are great with them in the hallway. But I miss that time to like connect with them because at the end of the day, it's the partnership that I love the most. Um, so I end up doing like a lot of groundwork and, you know, walking them around and I've taken my four-year-old in hand, you know, around the outdoor, in the outdoor, you know, I have a small fence outside. So, you know, if anything, if anything gets real, he's going to jump out. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I stayed inside for a little while. But um, yeah, I mean, we try to, you know, take care of their legs and their joints and their growing bones. And, um, you know, as far as setbacks, I think you always have to listen to the horse. I think sometimes it's difficult to know um, is this a physical thing or is this like mental immaturity and yeah. when do you need to get pushed through? When do you need to back off? Um, a lot of times with our three-year-olds, we get them started and then we turn them back out and just let them kind of chill out for the summer and then get them restarted going again in the fall. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've got like our general rules, but then again, every horse is different. Um, and you know, it's just about listening to the horse and adapting. Allison? I do a lot of groundwork. I'm going to echo what everybody else has said, but I actually do quite a few from the ground up. And I spend a lot of time, you know, when they're real babies, maybe, well, sometimes they're born here. Um, and sometimes they come in at, you know, two or five. But I really like to know that I can turn them off my body, that I can get them to stop just by my positioning, that they'll follow me and respect my space. I do that every day with every horse, actually, even to the horror of their great diva natures, um, the Grand Prix <laughs> horse. Um, and then by the time you get on them, usually it's not such a big event. Um, I was very fortunate to start my own personal horse who I bought uh, at six weeks old. She's now uh, eight. And I have just had the joy of seeing her grow up and she's we call her the beasaur because she's gigantic and uh she has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown and i think at eight she is finally done and so her program has very much reflected her growth patterns um when she i backed her um at three and then she needed some time off she went with my friend who's an event writer bully selmeyer to aiken the winter she was born mm -hmm. coming to florida so that she could hack out and just hang out with some with her buddy who was a year older and that was a great experience for her um another um the sort of opposite horse is a little guy who came in um from one of my clients colleen rutledge in the fall he was a horse that she had bred and purchased for herself but he's just you know probably not going to be an event horse and she thought well see what you can do maybe you'll be in the hunters because he's a nice jumping horse and he is a very nice jumping horse, but he's grown three inches since he came in November and put on a ton of muscle and developed um, a really fun and quirky and interesting personality, which was perhaps a bit less fun over the winter, but is really <laughs> fun and charming now. And now he's looking like he's going to maybe be a really nice dressage horse. He's rideable. He's funny. He's quick to learn. He's positive about it. And when he was silly, he did jump out of my outdoor arena, but I'm still here, so that's okay. Yeah. Um, what's Florida for but an adventure or two? <laughs> so I guess the one thing I would say in terms of setbacks is a, a story I can tell about the horse who was reserve national champion in the material for the Dutch horses last year. Her name's Jacob Giordoni. It's a very nice horse owned by Andrea Woodner. We brought her over when she was three. Um, super nice mare. 
She is um, hot. <laughs> She's an Everdale cross with jazz. And um, stunningly beautiful mare. She can really, really move. And she has a sense of humor that is only funny to her sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so I have had to learn to really kind of figure out what she thinks is funny and meet her there. Because my, what she deemed complete lack of sense of humor was not going to get us anywhere. And I have to be really flexible with her. And some days she just wants to be already a grumpy horse. You know, sometimes I half halt and she's piaffing. And I'm like, okay, well, that's really cool, but I need you to trot, you know? <laughs> and some days she quite literally can't trot because she's so interested in patterns of light on the ground that we have to go look at them for 10 minutes before we can function. So she has really taught me that a good rider with a strong back can get almost any horse who's talented to do anything, but you will pay later. And I have spent the winter and now this part of the spring repairing what I would consider the, the credit card bill of the material championship. It was nice. I mean, who doesn't love an 80%, but it probably allowed her to lock her back and fling her legs for about two months more than she ever should have been allowed to do it. So it was nice. The ribbons are good, whatever, but I probably should have cut it two months earlier than we did we would have won anyway so that's that's my uh cautionary tale because i didn't realize how much credit i was living on until i had to start paying the bills <laughs> i allison i love that story because i always you know you always want to buy like a super talented horse um and i kind of laugh uh, because i i also want a super talented horse but i sort of want to keep that a secret for the first like three years of their life. Like, I know you can trot like hell, but let's just go on the bit and bring up your back and go over some trot poles and act like a citizen and don't We did none of those things. She only has one trot. Exactly. And it's like, you know, to try to just teach them boring because then once their bodies are ready, it's like, then you can like, you know, really get after it. But uh, yeah, we, we all trained the champion young horse that's like, not not supple and and difficult so i i love that story she can do an aerial 180 that's really funny <laughs> do you think that a common mistake with um less experienced trainers and maybe adult amateurs is not being able to recognize when the basics aren't really solid and sort of comparing their four or five-year-old with friends, four and five-year-olds that may be a little bit ahead or in case of eventing, maybe they're already ready to do yeah. you know, novice. Yep. And in eventing, it becomes such a serious safety issue. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at the four and five-year-old uh, U.S. EA stuff um it's a higher level like the four-year-olds are at the championships around novice and the five-year-olds around training and we have some that can do that and we have most that are not ready for that and uh I think because you see some spectacular four and five-year-olds a lot of people think that every four and five-year-old should be doing that and in eventing it does become such a safety issue um, so being in you know a program and having good trainers and good mentors is always so important Yes. JJ? Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine what that looks like in eventing, you know, when, when horses are overfaced with, you know, the everything that they're asked for, you know, because in dressage, it's like, we also pay for it, but it's in such a different way. And it's a little bit less obvious, you know, so sometimes like, you know, you know, too strong a contact and running the horse forward, like that kind of takes it's toll, but sometimes you don't n notice it until it's like, oh, I cannot teach this thing a flying change because it's always running, you know? So um, sometimes it's, I think it may be a little less obvious for dressage people. And, um, you know, there's the opposite thing too. I mean, sometimes we get five-year-olds in training and they drop it off and they're like, I don't canter it under saddle. And it's like, <laughs> well, I'm I don't want to canter it either under saddle <laughs> when it has like not cantered under saddle. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, you know, 
take time, but don't waste time. And now it's like, okay, who's going to, you know, who's going to be the first to candor it under Zeta? Like, not me. <laughs> so, like, we kind of, you know, I think it's so individual. And I, I agree that it's like, you need to have good trainers in your life and good guides, good mentors to just, you know, even friends that are other trainers to kind of throw things off of them. Like, hey, have you ever had this before, you know, the, his stifles keep locking. What do you do with that? You know, or this one, you know, just doesn't want to canter on the right lead or whatever. And, um, some horses make it look super easy and some horses end up amazing at the end, but were really difficult in, in the beginning. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just think it's always good. You know, it's like, it takes a village to, uh, produce a good horse after many years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just have to say that my um my grand prix horse lionheart when he was learning changes he was like a spaz and it took two years and but once he finally got it i thought you know doing tempies with this horse is going to be a nightmare that horse learned one tempies the first time i asked once he learned a single blind change everything all the, the tempies were easy that was that was Apollo. I mean, it took him like nine months to learn one good change, and now that's like his best thing. Two years. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your commitment, Tigger. <laughs> I finally had to go to Europe to get it. <laughs> yeah, I had to get some really serious help. <laughs> Allison, how about you? Oh, I think it is so hard to train in a vacuum. And friends, colleagues are the best thing that trainers, any trainer, any level of experience can have to keep you really focused and thinking about the right perspective for your horse and or whatever horses you have in, you know, that month or that season. I really count on my colleagues and friends to answer text messages when I say, I just am I completely behind with this horse? I can't even turn left this month, you know, or hey, I got a change. I, I think I'm doing something right, finally. Um, so I'm really grateful to, to everybody who answers those texts. Um, and I, I have been, just like JJ said, I get a lot of those restarts, the older horses who've maybe been through some trainers and now have some habits. I am the goddess of the rearing mare. It is my calling, apparently. <laughs> she stands up, Senator Dallas and Katie. Uh, and I'll remember I, that. Yeah, yeah me but, too. <laughs> I often can figure it out and I'm happy to help people. I guess I wish everybody had better help because so frequently I see a, a good hearted amateur buy a nice young horse, maybe not in a program or an inconsistent program or a program with somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience with young horses. And it goes south and it go it takes a long time for that person to realize it's too late because of their personal relationship with the trainer or lack of finances or whatever. And by the time they do realize it, maybe the horse is now 17, three or seven years old or whatever. And if only, you know, we could have started again um, earlier, maybe we would have gotten a bit further faster. Uh, Tigger of course knows Amidala and I had the great pleasure of, and honor of being Amidala's last rider. Um, but I wish I had been her first rider because she was an astonishing horse. She was a talented horse. She was brave as anything, but she was not capable of being trained. And you always look back on a horse like that. Who I got her when she was 18 and had multiple injuries. And, you know, you say, what were you like when you were four, darling? Because I would have liked to know you then. You know, I think you, this is a, a good place to seg into what, what, do you guys look for in a young horse? You know, what are the qualities that you think are most important? Sky? Well, I mean, what everyone looks for, confirmation, temperament, training. What does that mean to you? What does confirmation mean to you well, as a center? For us, you're looking more for the marathon runners, right? <laughs> I mean, we need the strength, but we need the we need the horses that can be quick across the ground and land lightly. Um but I'm going to be honest, the big thing we look for is technique over the fence. And for me, instinct, because um, it is so much about safety. 
And um, I told you, we do a lot of off the track horses and uh, in, even in the sport horses, we always like to see some free jumping videos um, with no riders on them as young horses, you know, right off the track and just see what their instincts are off the ground. Um, that's big for me. I need to see they're quick. I need to think they're smart if you get into trouble and that they want to do it because you can't make any horse jump those jumps they don't want to <laughs> what do you do for the flat version for the uh, portion um yeah, oh, trainability um a lot about uh temperament and their brain um you know we've had a lot of horses that maybe aren't the most talented as far as movement or maybe aren't the best conformationally but if they're trainable they can do a lot more than the beautiful ones that aren't trainable. <laughs> I'm on a lot of those too. <laughs> so um, I, I do look, I do look for temperament. JJ, what do you look for? Yeah. I mean, temperament for sure is uh, really high on the list. Like, just like Skylar said, like there's a lot of talented ones out there that <laughs> if you can't ride it. It's like not, not that great. And I've taken a lot, of you know not totally normal but you know um nothing spectacular and i mean fiji just won the four star in florida in the grand prix and you know he's a pretty you know normal normal guy and you know what i always buy is an excellent walk i always want to buy an excellent canter because i know through the work that i do i can teach them to trot um, and I want a horse with a nice, um, strong back. You know, I want it to, you know, when I look at it, I want the lines to be harmonious and I want his top line to be strong. Um, you know, and straight legs and all that, because it also has to stay sound. You like and, a square or a rectangle? Um, you know, I, I kind of like, a, I mean, I would say it's a long square. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do, I've always loved the Holsteiner because it's a little bit longer. It's a little bit more rectangular, but it has a really good suppleness and a really strong loin. Um, they typically have really good canters, but I also, you know, love the Hanoverians that are a little bit more square. Um, I think Dutch are awesome too. They're much more, uh, square. Um, you know, each, each body has its own challenge, you know, a uh, short coupled horse, you have to teach them how to be longer and bend better and put their neck down and you know a longer horse you got to teach to be more squared up and um, for me it's really about the uh function of their pelvis i really want a horse that um actually just like skylar said too i love a light-footed horse you know when the, you you see this like amazing horse on the video and then you like turn the volume on and you can hear it like <laughs> thunder footing around it's like you know that is not gonna, it's not supple in the back you know you even in dressage like you want a horse that uses their best fuels right they move like a cat over the ground and they're supple um and I want a horse that is um we always say like sensitive but very sensible um I don't mind if they're a little spooky in the beginning because I know with training that same alertness that makes them react to their um environment will eventually be towards me and you know once they trust me and um so yeah I want a horse that's alert but wants to connect like I love horses that you can really look into their eyes and you can really see them they're looking for a connection um so that's always the most fun that you can also get a horse that wants a partnership Allison so I really want to pick up where JJ left off when I look for horses for myself, I look first for that click, the way they're, the way they look at me, the way they display their body, the way they think someone's looking at me now, I should maybe show off a little bit. And I think if they have that, plus the desire to please, you can get away with some confirmational flaws. I do get away with confirmational flaws. Um, some of that temper can light up a bit, and certainly one should have a bucking strap when one rides those. But um, for me, it's that uh, they're a little bit arrogant. They're going to grow up to be opera divas. They're not going to want to be in the chorus of the ballet. They really want to be the star. And 
all of the horses that I've had the pleasure of developing myself, whether I bred them or purchased them as very young horses and then brought along, have had that from the beginning, the real desire to be the center of the world. And when they believe that they're that, once you can get that ego on your side, you have this joyful, extraordinary partner who always believes that she's the most impressive thing in the room. And I just, I love that. When I look for clients, I look for something different. Um, I think particularly for amateurs who are looking at young horses, temperament is the single most important thing. The horse has to want to be their friend. The horse has to want to please. He or she has to have been started correctly or be willing to be started correctly. And for me, starting begins at leading. Um, right from the beginning, I really want a horse who says, oh, the person's the boss and, and I'm gonna really listen to her and try to make her happy. Those are the horses who will be the best amateur horses. They are not, not going to be Grand Prix horses. People say, oh, he's a good horse. He doesn't want to be an FBI champion. Why not? Those are good horses. They're pleasers. Those are horses who are going to go very far for their person and going to bring a lot of joy to that person's life. So when I'm looking for an adult amateur and we go and look at a lot of young horses, I'm looking for that moment that they smile at each other and say, hey, we could be friends, don't you think? And I always, I try to keep lines that I like, um, which tend to be a little bit hotter and often a bit obnoxious um, on one side. I would not show an amateur something by Everdale and Jazz. Um, but sometimes a little heat mixed well with a good solid D line is gonna give you that right, lovely body, great temperament, real desire to please. So I don't cut out Sandro hit just because his back in the top line are a little difficult. There are a lot of good Sandro hits. You just have to find the right one for that person. So confirmation matters, of course it matters. Um, I think the best thing I've done is really study breeders. I pay a lot of attention to bloodlines. I watch what they're doing. I, I really like looking at the way American breeders have improved their breeding programs over the last, say, 20 years, and they're wonderful. Their websites are quite literally biographies of American breeding. So you can hang out on rollingstonefarm.com or Iron Spring or um, Meridale Farm or whatever and get a great education in what American dressage and sport horse breeding has become in America. And, and then of course we have the great privilege of the internet to allow us to also look at European breeding. And I, I strongly recommend people spend that time, perhaps not as much as I do, but um, I enjoy it. I've learned a lot. Sky, do you, do you look at the pedigree of the thoroughbreds that you- Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, but it's so much, most of the time comes down to the personality of the horse and, and the experiences those horses have been through. Um, I will say like one thing I do look about with the racehorses is a lot of people shy away if they, uh, from horses that have raced a lot. And actually the ones that have raced a lot seem to be, um, not all the time, but sounder a lot of times. They uh, have held up longer in the racing world, but you also then have to juggle the uh, baggage that comes with that. Um, and some of the horses that broke down after one or two races, uh, that can be a little bit of its turn for us. Um, but I do a lot of young riders and I do a lot of adult amateurs and I would look for a completely different horse for them than I would for myself, um, just like Allison was saying. So we do look at the pedigrees, but we look a lot at the personality. Would you look more at a warm blood for an amateur? If they had that option, um, a lot of my eventing clients want to do the off the track horses because we've done so many. Um, but I look for a very different thoroughbred than I would that I ride. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's hard because a lot of times with the thoroughbreds, you're buying off the Internet and you're buying off confirmation shots. Um, I try to go with uh, people I know, um, like a in between that knows maybe the racehorse trainer or knows where the horse is coming from. That's where we've had our best luck. I am a little nervous about doing it off the internet, which has become very popular. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I do, I mean, we've gotten some great horses that way too, but in that, in that case, you don't always know what you're getting. You're, you're gambling. Right. JJ? Yeah, I loved it. Um, I teach a bunch of event 
riders too. And, you know, some of the best ones have had like quite a career and you're like, okay, if they lasted that long on the track, like they are, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're going to be fine. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, and sometimes, you know, yeah, they, they do get a quick injury and then they, then they don't have the baggage of being trained so long on the track and they turn out okay. They get enough time to rest and yeah. And like that. But um, yeah, I mean, my husband, Richard is actually excellent about pedigrees and he's Swedish. So, um, you know, he's, you know, just really, and he worked for, you know, Hilltop for a long time. And uh, so he like loves breeding. So I just like a good horse, <laughs> you know, um, there are certain lines that you kind of know, like, oh yeah, that's going to be spookier or that's going to be a little tricky in the back. Um, you know, one of my heart horses, uh, summer, uh, is a Sir Donner Hall and that's typically not super easy. And she's, um, the red queen. So, um, you know, that, that, that she had some really good R line on her mother's side, which made her really rideable. So, um, you know, I think it just kind of, you know, kind of matters, but, you know, you can definitely see that there's a thread of, you know, Apollo's an Ampere and I'm helping another client um, over Zoom in New Hampshire and she has a uh, half sister to him and they're very similar, you know, so I definitely um, keep the pedigree in mind, but um, yeah, I really want to go for, you know, if there's chemistry there, if I connect with their character and if I like the gates. And again, it doesn't need to be a fancy trot. We know we can make that happen. What is, what do you guys do? What's your advice on managing the health and diet of young horses, including the turnout and massage, Cairo, the whole ball of wax? Allison? I am a big believer in turnout. I think probably everybody on this panel is. Um, <laughs> my... I don't let them live out just because we have a pretty serious coyote issue here, even with the, the very brave draft mules defending the property at all costs, um, the coyotes get hungry. So, but we turn out the babies the day they're born, if they can get up, they're out. And um, that's something that's really worked out well for us. I mean, the two that we've bred and raised here, um, one whose mom unfortunately foundered a week out uh, because of an injury, um, we still she was brave enough to, to go with the filly outside and, and the other mare did super. And, um, you know, we have a good turnout. We put him out with another good mare who has had uh, foals usually after the first month. So they're right away getting used to other horses. And the one whose mom died at three months was actually adopted by a half legger pony who became her nanny and uh, went to Devon with her. <laughs> so... Um, she I, 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 I was thinking more of the three, four, five year olds. Oh, sorry. Um, so <laughs> for them, um, yeah, still big turnout. I mean, all of our horses go out in the morning and they, they sort of come into work. And if it's good weather, they go right back out. I like them to stay on um, a good basic pellet once they're weaned off the Marin bull feed. Um, you know, just until their bones are done. And that's when I switch them to whole food. I still am a little bit lacking confidence myself in figuring out that ultimate percentage in uh, whole food that's going to really get the bones and the joints through the, every developmental hurdle. I feed TNA, um, knock on wood, have never had a problem with OCD or anything like that here. Um, and in terms of supplements, the every horse here is on optimum um which i think is just an excellent all-around multi-purpose mineral and uh support supplement and give them a lot of hay i keep the grain really light mm -hmm. and uh, when they're growing you leave them alone and when they level out you you work them a little bit harder that's that that would be my program how about like massage and chiropractics and acupuncture when uh, for you does so, that come in yeah, sorry, I forgot that bit. Um, so I have a wonderful chiropractor, Ollie Dix, who comes, thank the Lord, from Florida when he can, uh, usually every sort of five to six weeks. And the babies do get done because they are growing and their bodies are very elastic and you'd like to sort of keep putting them back into place. So like the one I'm breaking now, 
perhaps one of her friends t-boned her and so perhaps we need to keep working on that chiropractically um i have really terrific body workers um who come and put everybody back together so i would say those are pretty important um for me as just part of my regular training program and i've seen such big changes in young horses because their bodies are so plastic and something starts to go wrong but you can fix it and you can fix it with minimal intervention rather than having to wait till they're seven or eight or nine or ten and it's already a physical pattern you could just right away get you know get it done so i am uh, a big believer in all those things for sure sky um okay start with turnout <laughs> Um, so each, each horse is different as far as our turnouts. Um, my dressage horse is actually an Irish horse and hates turnout. So I'm kind of a big believer in turnout to their happiness. Um, my off the track horse, my upper level event horse loves turnout. Um, and then my five-year-old lives out. So <laughs> everyone's a little different. And I think that all depends on what each, each horse wants and needs. Um, and we, we try to really cater to that at Morningside because we have very different personalities and very different horses. Um, we have metabolic horses that cannot be on turnout. Um, and then we have thoroughbreds like mine that you can't ride unless they're on turnout, lots of turnout. So, <laughs> so I, I think it's really you know, individual. What's your feeding plan like? Feeding uh, plan. Sorry, uh, we, try, we try to stay um, low sugar, but a lot of our horses need the higher fat higher omega um, protein. Uh, they're obviously some of the upper level horses need a lot more. Um, we try to, you know, again, cater that specifically to each horse. We have 40 event horses right now at Morningside. So each, each one is very different. A lot off the track, a lot imported, some from Ireland, some from Europe, all, all different types. So I think that uh, is very individualized. And the hay that you feed? Uh, free choice, good quality, free choice as much as possible. Just a grass hay? Grass hay, uh, orchard grass, yeah, mix, okay. yep. And how about massage, chiropractics for the yep. young horses? Yep, uh, we do, uh, every two weeks my horses get massages, um, do a lot of chiro work, um, body work, that's always in their routines. So my horses, personal. It's a bit personal to every client, you know, so most of the upper level horses, that's in the routine. How about other therapies? Uh, um, you know, the big thing I say is like with the vets being proactive, not waiting till there's a problem. So we try to take like our young horses maybe every six months just to get a basic check, a baseline, jog with them, see where they're starting uh, as the uh -huh. work increases. Do they stay there? Uh, but again, being proactive, not, not wait until there is a problem. Right. JJ? Yeah. Um, we the same as everybody on the panel um we don't have really huge fields like i said we're still we're building some in the back which i'm really excited about um so we've got two horses uh that were going out together which was great otherwise we've got all individual paddocks um some uh we've got two like all weather paddocks so like some of my young horses go out in the morning and then if there's time they go out again you know i just I'm a real uh, fan of movement. I think that, you know, horses are meant to be moving as much as possible. We also feed, you know, a Timothy Hay, you know, that's just, they eat as much as possible all day. Um, some have hay bags, some don't. Um, you know, we really want them to kind of have the free choice hay. Um, yeah, got, you know, we try to keep, um, some are on the whole food diet and some are on, you know, like the, the low sugar, you know, kind of, you know, we like to keep just like Allison, like we want, we like to keep the grain low. Um, I always get really worried when I go to other stables and there's like this giant bucket of grain that they get like twice a day, you know? So we, if we have a hard keeper and we need to feed that one, we'll break it up into like four or five meals. Um, I agree totally with everybody as far as you know, get in front of your horse's body, get to know it and get in, get in front of any problems. Um, Tim Ober is my vet and, you know, he's right there in Charlottesville. 
um, Tigger, I know you know him really well. Really and well. He would always say, you know, by the time somebody calls a vet, you're basically three lamenesses in, you know? So I love that where it's like, you know, it's important to take care of the horse's top line, um, make sure they're healthy. And with that, you know, I love, you know, the chiropractics. Um, I have some really great, you know, massage therapists. And I just love to check in with them too. You know, even if it's nothing that to see, it helps me know the horse's body. Like, oh, maybe I need to get that saddle checked because she's finding something new that wasn't there, you know, a month ago. So um, definitely chiropractics, definitely massage. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's also just like with my younger horses, um, sometimes I just like to watch them on the lunge just for my own, you know, I just want to see how their bodies are moving, you know, is, you know, are they healthy or how are they carrying themselves? Um, so yeah, we try to keep everything, you know, just staying ahead of, of any problems that we come across. Can well, I just we, interject? Yeah. One thing would be the importance of a really good farrier. Yes. I yes. My babies barefoot <laughs> as long as I can. So um Beatrix who's now eight she got front shoes at seven and hind shoes when she turned eight that was about when she earned them in my opinion <laughs> um really would love to keep them barefoot as long as possible and um if you have a good farrier who's just an excellent trim maestro then you see those horses really develop well and you know I, I hate to put shoes on until I have to that's that's all I would say so you know, not every horse is blessed with a great soul. And obviously you got to put shoes on some of them earlier, but if I can, I really do try to keep them off and let the feet sort of be what they're going to be. And you can do so much with a good farrier who's willing to work with a young horse and sort of look at the way a foot flares or look at the way a foot is wearing differently and, and help you train better. It's just an amazing relationship if you can have that. You know, it was, it was Dr. Tim Ober that taught me about pulling shoes and letting the horse go barefoot for a couple of months and that I that was a really aha for me now it's a little bit more difficult when horses are competing now all year long and, and it, it used to be that we competed in the spring and the summer and we finished in the fall and then we weren't really competing in the winter um so it was a lot easier to take two or three months, pull the shoes, let the feet spread and get hard, be in contact with the earth. But any time that you can do that, particularly with young horses, uh, it, 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 the benefits will last through the horse's lifetime, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. like, okay. Uh, so. Our, no, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. I was going to say for us. <laughs> South Carolina, our ground gets pretty hard. Uh, so we do end up um, like putting front shoes on, you know, some of the young horses. But um, just like Allison said, like I like to leave them without hind shoes unless I feel they need more support through their stifles. Or, you know, I kind of think like when I start to do collection is when I start to add the shoes uh, behind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you keep training interesting for a young horse, Sky? Oh, it's always interesting with event horses. <laughs> well, I, 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 mean, for the I know, I know. I, <laughs> so, so one one thing that we do a lot of, and I know um, Allison um, and JJ mentioned this, is we do a lot of groundwork. And um, we do, uh, we call it roping with a long line and a rope halter. Um, and it's the no bit, no tack, just the nose pressure. And uh, we teach a lot of our young horses cross country that way. So they learn drops into water, ditches, banks, tracaners, ditch, I mean, you name it. We will rope them over it before we do it on them. Um, and we, we implement, implement that into the young horse schedule on almost every horse we have. So um, would you start that as a four or five year old? Uh, we start that, we'll do a little bit of it. Um, as a four year actually quite a bit as a four year old um I think it helps like JJ said to watch to watch how they how they jump what their instincts are you know how their bodies work um and it's fun for the horse uh if they like it and if they don't like it they may not be great event horse <laughs> Um, but we do a lot of variation um I take my young horses with the upper level horses to shows 
Um, so they don't show, but they go in hands and they go through by the warm ups and stand by the rings. And uh, they try, we try to do like a field trip a week, um, whether that's oh, like, wow. a, yeah, well, with the four and five year olds, not, not super young, but even if it's in hands, just learning how to get on the trailer, learning um, about different venues, seeing horses canter by, warm ups. Yeah, that's, that's one big thing we do. And how about the hacking and the, the Tons lighting? of hacking. Tons of hacking. Yeah, we have a hack day. Um, and I said that in our schedule earlier. We try to hack as much as possible. Um, and it just, you know, as an event horse, they ha well, and as dressage horses, they, they have to be brave and they have to be independent. Um, and it's also like really nice time with the horse and rider just to take a break from the ring. Yes, for sure. Yeah. AJ? Yeah, I, I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got uh, an indoor and an outdoor and then a separate round pen. And so we do, yeah, we just never keep it really like the same. You know, I mean, I think it's important to, while you're producing a system for the horse, that moment, that time needs to be really consistent. Um, they need to know, you know, okay, go down here. I get lunge, then I get ridden. I behave myself. I'm in there with other horses. Okay, you like that that piece we try to keep really like that he can rely on that it's just the same and you know but um a lot of times then we like change it to the round pen we do groundwork in the round pen um like I said I take my 4 year old uh sometimes in the rope halter sometimes just in the bridle um on you know excursions around um I love it that Skylar goes like so often like when I'm like woof once a week, girl, like we try, <laughs> we try. <laughs> you don't want to have it that you're putting the horse on the horse trailer when it's an emergency, you know, it's like, right. they need, like, this is what we do. So get with everybody, you know? Um, so I'm sure my husband's going to be really happy to hear that. Cause I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I, Freddie's ready to go in public and he's like, he needs to, you know, and I'm like, Oh, um, but it's great. um, yeah, I mean, you just ground poles, Cavaletti. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, and I and I think uneven ground is so yeah. important, of course, to stimulate their legs, strengthen their legs. Um, we have some hills. I think that's great. Um, yeah, and we've got trot poles set up all the time in our outdoor. So um, uh, it's just nice that they're just always up because otherwise it's like, oh, I got to get off and put them up. You know, then they then you go do it. So they're just up all the time, set for trot, and you can just, you know, get, you know, we've got a really big outdoor, so our dressage ring is, like, in the middle, but you could, we've got the sides open that you could, like, canter out and around, and then the ground poles are set on the outside of the dressage ring, That's so you cool. could stay in the dressage ring or go out and around and take a big canter, get a little bit of two-point, and let them stretch over their backs, and yeah, just, and I love ground poles, I mean... I don't, I can't buy the fanciest horses, so I have to teach them how to trot. <laughs> so uh, the ground poles really help with that. <laughs> Allison? Yeah, so all of the dressage horses who come here jump um, because I think it's important that they know how to jump and be capable of coping with obstacles. And as a result, I've sold a number of them as hunters um, <laughs> because they're really good at it jumping and they love to lope to a jump and a few of them have actually sold as event horses too because they or jumpers because they're perky and they love it and it that's what lights them up and they really enjoy it um it's always funny to see the dressage horses when faced with an obstacle you can tell who's going to be a dressage horse you know? they're like wait i'm sorry i didn't i didn't actually sign up for this activity <laughs> but the mares have to free jump in order to do their performance tests for every book except the Dutch. Um, and unless you're a jumping line Dutch, then, then they do. And I think that's a valuable asset. And I, I like jumping small jumps. I do not want to jump the things that Skyla jumps. Thank you so much. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I'll, I'm perfectly happy jumping around two six. And I like the horses to be confident and, and jumping like that. I also have a giant mountain in my back behind my arena. And when they're young and their stifles are weak, I actually jog them up like I run next to them because um, we all need to be fitter. <laughs> and 
uh, as they get stronger, I'm so grateful because then I could stop jogging and ride them. <laughs> I have no outdoor arena here. I just have a big field. And as JJ said, that uneven footing is just awesome because they get used to having to find their own footing. I'm not going to babysit if we fall down. That's awkward, but we'll be okay. Um, and my big front field is right next to the road. So they get used to motorcycles and trucks and <laughs> all sorts of fun things. Um, so that's pretty great. My friend, Alex, who's an event rider is kind enough to um, allow me to come over to his farm with horses and hack. Uh, usually one of us looks like a popcorn popper, <laughs> but <laughs> we, uh, we enjoy this. It's, it's a way to spend some time in the summer and so I would say I try to do all sorts of different things. And um, one thing I, I learned actually from a, a breaker who I, I really respect, he said, look, you've got a horse who's being a little bit silly, make it more interesting. Don't try to routine them to death. And so I build them obstacle courses in the ring with all sorts of stuff like um, flowers and fake Liverpools and uh, jump standards and little jumps and ground poles and all sorts of things. and you know, you do that, even if you only do it once every two weeks, it perks them up and they're interested and they're like, oh, are we going to walk on the blue thing today or are we going to pick it up and wave it around the way they all seem to do with that Liverpool uh, in the end. So that's, that's what I like to do. I mean, I think you have to walk the fine line with young horses between going to Montessori, right? And the horse just only <laughs> indulges her inner creativity. And too much. English boarding school where you do nothing but grammar. <laughs> so I, I try to walk the line, you know. So before we get into some um, of our attendees' questions, my final question, which is a real setup, and I admit it, what's everybody's favorite Biostar product? Sky? Oh, you know, Tigger. <laughs> Theracom, <laughs> all the way. <laughs> Can yeah, you say uh, bye? Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously it's helping the gut, alleviating stress, um, going for focus and calm with my event horse. Uh, it's been, it's been game changing for my upper level event horse. I have to say, really? uh, yeah, he travels a lot. He's a bit ulcery. He's a thoroughbred raced for five years. Um, and he has a hard time channeling his emotions uh, but that also goes hand in hand with with his gut and with the ulcers and uh it it has been so helpful and and for i mean you know tigger my horses have been on on those products forever so <laughs> yeah i i love love the theracom jj i i couldn't decide so i brought both <laughs> <laughs> so um like my a couple of horses that have like <coughs> want to support their stomachs we have a lot of them on the bioflora because when you hear tigger i mean tigger makes me want to eat clean like whenever i hear tigger talk i'm like yes i need to change my own diet and the horse's <laughs> diet oh my god you know um so we love the bioflora and um we just started using probably the last year the the colostrum and um Ashley had a horse that really cut up her leg and it was amazing how much that helped uh with the healing uh so that was really exciting to actually like we could see it helping and improving um and then I will have to say uh Fiji you know had a great season and did great uh and we used a lot of star power because <laughs> he needs he he needed to wake up <laughs> and uh get give me all he's got in the Grand Prix. So um, the star power was a new addition we made this year. And I, that was really helpful to help him kind of, um, you know, in a really natural way, uh, increases. Energy. So that was, a, you know, but, but they're all great. Allison, what's your favorite Biostar product? Well, all right. My, my general favorite for every single age of horse is Ligatent. Um, I, will testify to my love of Ligatent by bringing you into my kitchen. Are you ready? We're gonna go in the kitchen now. Don't wake up, stop it. Ready. Okay, we're going in the kitchen. We're turning on the lights. This is all the Ligatent. <laughs> the containers of Ligatent that I then reuse for other things. 
um, because we order a lot of them. It's awesome for the young horses who are, you know, their stifles can get a little bit strained when they grow. And it is just game changing for older horses who are under stress of competition or injury. Um, I've had two soft tissue injuries that we treated with compression and obsessive amounts of ice and um, Ligaten twice a day. And those horses healed about 30 days faster than the vets expected based on their original ultrasounds. So I am a true fan of Ligaten. Um, Optimum is my basic, every horse should be on this mineral. I think it's just absolutely awesome. Uh, it's whole food that supports the whole body and the joints and the gut. You're never gonna go wrong with that. And then for, <laughs> for the grumpy divas of my life, who are being asked every day to do work that they think is probably illegal and they have lawyers and agents and things like that. Quantum has been a game changer. Quantum doesn't just give horses wings. It doesn't just give horses energy. It gives them the body mass, the muscle development and the pop in those big muscles. When I get to the end of a Grand Prix and they're crying because it's a really long, hard test. And the last thing is passage piaf passage. And they're hot and it's 90 degrees and it's humid and they would probably like a drink and then possibly, you know, a slave to fan them. Instead, what they get is quantum and they can bust through it. For the shy ones, Inzen is just awesome. Um, it keeps those horses brave when I need them to be brave. And for <clears throat> dragons, Xenex is the way to go. So that's my, uh, the cornucopia of Biostar. If only I had stayed in the barn, you could have seen my feed room. It's embarrassing. <laughs> so we have a question, which is um, on stifles. Um, this is from Mary Ryan. My 12-year-old trips behind from stifle issues. Will that help repair? My guys are on Optimum Senior, but you guys recommend Ligatend, question mark. Allison, I'm going to turn that directly to you. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Um, and I would also recommend that you really work on, so this winter I had such a great conversation with Jim Belden, who's one of the best renowned sports medicine vets in the country. And he also um, was a veterinarian for the Triple Crown winner in 1976. So what he said to me was, look, it's a big, big young horse. And that means your physics suck. So if I were you, I'd get out there and trot for 20 minutes both ways. I'm not kidding. Get on it and trot. I said, trot, but don't you think that cantering is better for the stifles? And he gave me this gentlemanly glare and said, no, because the only gait that evenly uses both hind legs is the trot. You can canter when you're done. And you know what? He was right. <laughs> because I took that big young horse who was on ligatend anyway, and I put her out and I did 20 minutes each way at the trot. And then I cantered and then I came back into 10 more minutes. And while we were both very, very tired, by the end of that month, she was strong and much more consistent in her stifles. So I think there's a tendency with weak stifle horses to back off and maybe look a little bit more at the canter. But I'm going to say ligatend and trot, 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 lots of hills, lots of transitions, make them work those stifles, just like um, young women who play soccer have a lot of knee injuries. And that's because the, the angles of your pelvis to your knee are bad if you're female. Well, you know what you can do to fix that? Muscle. So build it up, get that horse strong, and I think you'll have a lot more success um, helping him overcome what, what might just be a conformational weakness. I want to thank you all. Before we open it up, Emily, you're in charge of um, the, uh, any other questions, but um, Sky and JJ and Allison, you guys have been awesome tonight. I mean, awesome. And I really, really appreciate your time because we know with 40 horses and 30 horses and 35 horses each, um, you have a very long day. So giving your time tonight is really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Good job. Job. And, um, Emily, do we have any questions? And if we don't, we'll say goodbye. Okay, so Claire's question is about her horse. Um, so regarding buying a young horse who is six years old and started late, they've only been under saddle for five months. Um, she's looking for info on setting boundaries and managing workouts. Okay, JJ? Uh, is it a dressage horse? 
she's typing. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, either way. Yes. yes, okay. So either way, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I always say eventing is like extreme dressage. You know, it's like um, all the same questions. It's just there's, there's fences. Um, but yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's and hard. Speed, JJ, and, don't forget the speed and, factor. Yeah, like we complain we didn't get our tempi changes, and you know, if it's the distance, it's like you know, kind of serious. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it it's an extra challenge when the horse is big and strong and old enough, um, and that early foundation was not put in, you know, when they were younger. Um, you know, and I, I, again, like I would go to groundwork. I think um, I always say like respect first, friends later, um, because at the end of the day, that's just about safety. And the horse has to be responding to me properly on the ground um, before I ever even get in the saddle. Um, I do think teaching a horse to lunge properly um, most of the times with side reins, but I, I have um, some horses that I, can teach you know connect with them a little bit better without the side reins um but i do think um if we're talking about like a horse that tends to be a little bit of a a bully or a bit pushy um side reins can help sort of teach them about the parameters of where they should be what their balance like they just teach themselves um how to put themselves in the right balance um but definitely lots of groundwork and like Allison had said earlier, I mean, that's walking out to the paddock that is standing in the wash stall like a gentleman. I mean, it's just everywhere, you know, that you are um, teaching that horse something. Sky? Stay right here. Sorry, guys. I have a, I have a friend that just visited me. <laughs> no, don't apologize. <laughs> my daughter just came up. <laughs> Hi. Oh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> Right here. <laughs> can I call on here too? Yes, right there. Can I call yeah. on the letter? Yes, right there. <laughs> All right, guys. I had to take a quick tea time. <laughs> so what, what do you do with a, a late broken young horse that doesn't have boundaries yet? You know, we get a we get a lot of those. I mean, my my upper level event horse didn't come off the track till he was five. Um, and you know, it's a very different, uh, situation, but we did a ton of groundwork, you know, like JJ was saying, um, and a lot of, uh, the rope work that I was talking about. Um, it's kind of like some Pirelli work mixed with the natural horsemanship. So they understand body language and respect. Um, and then on the eventing side, you know, we would add in the jumping and whatnot, but, um, we do a lot of lunging with side reins, um, and uh, I add that in like once a week for some of my horses that uh, are a little bit greener to connection and understanding the dressage phase. Um, so I agree with a lot of what JJ said there, but we do a lot of groundwork. Allison? Yeah, I mean, obviously everything my two colleagues have said is, is 100% what I would say too. I would reiterate the immortal words of Lauren Chumley, lunging saves lives. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> I have no shame. Back in the day before I had had, I don't know, the fifth head injury, I used to be like, oh, needs lunging. Now I'm like, lunge that until it's tired. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think they learn a lot lunging. I lunge over poles. Um, often I'll do three rails um, set at three, six, nine, and 12 on the lunge circle so that they have to trot through the middle, walk through the inside edge, and canter through the outside edge because it's a pain in the neck to have to go change them all the time. Um, and that's actually really good for a horse who's a little bit of a jerk because the horse has to really pay attention to his feet. You can change those distances. If you put the three poles at noon um, very close together and he misses them, he's going to give his feet a good clopping. So that's always a nice thing to do. Um, and I would also just say in the time you're with that horse, you have to be very clear in your own mind about what you're going to do that day. Because a horse who's used to running the show because no one has given him boundaries is pretty used to setting his own rules. So you have to be 100% mentally and physically clear today, we're going to do X and you get to X. As long as X is a reasonable goal, you get there. Um, and I would reiterate, I think we all talked about the importance of a good professional in your life. And I would say you, you probably should 
if you don't have one already, now is the moment to go find one um, because you really want some support while you're developing a relationship with this horse so that you can move on and have a great time. Yeah, she did message me that she rides at Concordia Dressage with the Arnold. So it sounds like that's, you know, it's good to that's have a good place. team behind that's, you. That's a great place. <laughs> I was able to unmute myself. Uh, yay. yay. So I, that, that's helpful. And, um, I feel like I'm in the right place. He's, um, he's a, he's a cool horse. I, I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> it's Good a luck. journey, not a destination. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're working on it, but thank you guys. I'm going to go back on mute. <laughs> you're, you're in great hands down there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did ride with you a while back. Um, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> yeah, I really I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Ashley? Yes, Ashley also emailed a question, um, and she's here. When we go to a competition, my young horse often starts the day very tense and nervous, which then makes me tense and nervous. Any tips to help him be more relaxed in new situations? They're calm. They're calm. <laughs> and lunging. <laughs> I actually taught Ashley on this horse a couple weeks ago. So um, I would say a couple things. One is you have a great trainer and, you know, really trust her. She knows what she's doing and you guys have a good relationship. And if you feel like the horse is a little up, just take it straight down and lunge it. You know, you don't need to play with it. He doesn't need to see the ring. Just take him down, let him lunge, give him a good solid 45 minutes of lunging. Then you get on and you do your job. And he, he is an off the track horse. I know he gets a little bit tight and a little bit high and you feel like you're never going to get a good hunt around out of him. But trust your system, trust your program. It worked really well for you and Fred and it's going to work really well for you and this guy. Justine's got a great handle on this. And I think if you can just trust the process, and the training that you've done and will continue doing this season, you guys are going to wind up in such a good place. You know, you already had a great beginning to the season in the winter. And then of course everything got put on hold, but this is a great horse for you and you're going to have so much fun. Um, try to trust the process. And I personally would be, you know, lunging more, never hurts yeah. to lunge an extra lunge 10 more. minutes. <laughs> lunge more. Sometimes till their eyeballs sweat. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a little Zenex and then lunge it more. <laughs> um we have a couple more so danielle are you still here danielle um she said my horse seems to love to canter on the right lead only i've been trying to work with him on the left lead but have not been able to get him on the left he always stays on the right both directions both at a lunge and under saddle with her riding uh, what would you suggest in working with him to get him cantering on the left lead? And he's also gated. JJ? Yeah. Um, when I have a horse um, that's really one-sided like that, I am, like, let's say I would be doing a circle down at A and I would be on the right lead. And what I try to do is, like, connect the hard lead to the good lead. So I would, um, like be on a 20 meter circle at A and then I would keep cantering and then I would go on the diagonal and then I would trot. I would try to trot just a couple of steps and in the corner up by M, uh, I would ask it to like get onto the left lead. Um, that has worked uh, for a lot of thoroughbreds who are also, you know, when they come off the track really one-sided and I'm sure Skylar has some really good ideas too. Um, but I, I try to like, uh, connect the hard lead onto the good lead without throwing them totally. It's not like I want to totally throw them off balance, but I almost want to like trick them to like, and now canter on this lead. Oh, look, you did it, you know. And again, I mean, lunging helps too, but if he's always doing it on the lunge line, you know, that um, sometimes I feel like I can have a little bit more control of their balance and their positioning. Um, sometimes it helps to bend them more. Sometimes it helps to bend them less, you know, so that's a little bit of a, you got to kind of figure that out, but, um, that I like that exercise for that. Sky. Well, what JJ said, you can just put a pole in that corner. So as you trot and you pick up the canner over the pole, 
Uh, we found that like a pole or a race Cavaletti will help a lot. We have a lot of race horses that are a bit funny about their leads and um, also in a smaller space, like our indoor is small. So we can use a pole and kind of use the walls a little bit to help them. And then, you know, super positive reinforcement when they get it right. Uh, but repetition, you know, repeating it. And when they get it right, that positive reinforcement. Allison? I would say two things. If he's not picking up the left lead and you know of no training reason why, I would have a chiropractor look at his pelvis. Because if the pelvis is not moving equally left, right, you might well have an explanation. Um, another thing that I learned, I did a like high performance young horse thing and Christoph Hess was the clinician. And I was on this gigantic three-year-old and he said, I said, I'm so sorry, the leads are very green. And he said, I don't care what lead he's on. What lead is he good at? And I said, oh, he's, he's better at his left lead. He said, okay, well, you know, you pick up your left lead in the corner. So I did and we're cantering around and he said, okay, now change direction. I'm like, all right. And the horse politely held his counter canter and he said, just keep cantering, change leads again, change direction again, change direction again, change direction again. On his own, the horse did a flying change. We had a party for him, put him away. And the next day he was like, so this, this other lead thing, maybe I should try that when I change direction. <laughs> and I've used that ever since that was many years ago. Now that horse is, uh, God, I think he's 11 or something now, but anyway, um, and, and with his new owner, but, um, I would, I've used that a lot just be willing to be wrong, you know, be wrong with the horse, just ride that it's off balance. It's horrible. You're going to hit the walls. I know all of those yeah. feelings. Try to just live with it and see, just keep changing direction. Those big long diagonals, keep changing direction, changing direction until he finally says, Oh wait, I could do something about this. I could make my own life better. You can't cross your hands over the neck. You can't do anything with your position to tell him what you want. You just keep your hand in front of you. You keep your leg even the horse will figure it out. But I, I would check that pelvis. Um, Alice had a little bit of a follow-up question, which is, what is your suggestion for horses that are heavy on the front end, also transitions and pulls? JJ? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the horse has to listen to the half halt. So um, if you try to do a half halt and that's not happening, then I always up it to like a full halt or lots of transitions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I really balance, really probably the balance and connection is probably the most important things to me, no matter what level. I mean, it's all relative, yeah. but um, a horse that's, you know, kind of um, just plowing down under the forehand, you know, I really, you know, want to get it shifted back onto its hind legs. So lots of transitions and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, starting, to introduce some of the lateral work to make them stronger behind. Okay, thank you. I try to do that, but I don't know. It's not working so well. <laughs> <laughs> I also try to move them forward sometimes when I halt or um, a little extra bend. He just is always so heavy. It's like, I feel like my hands are like gonna get, I don't, so sorry. I also have arthritic hands, so it's like really hard for me sometimes, but. I just Join. thought maybe you had something else up your sleeve that would maybe help. Join Team Tate Academy and you will get a new video every week. <laughs> 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 it's fun. I like it. All right, thank you. Emily? So Gail has a longer question. Um, I have a Dutch harness horse cross that I sent to training to be started under saddle the end of his three-year-old year, December 2019. I wasn't really updated much on his training and found after he had been there five months there might have been an issue. <laughs> I picked him up the beginning of May and realized he had a wolf tooth coming in and also his canine teeth were coming in. Contacted the vet and had him looked at. He has some resentment now and he really wasn't off the lunge. Now I have had someone leave me and he has gotten resentful looking at possibly bucking but I found this is what he had done to the trainer before I picked him up. I was even told he laid down with his equipment on and rubbed his face on the ground, which made me ask if his teeth had been checked. Then I was told that he had tried to buck her off the last few days before I picked him up after five months of training. I gave him bridal time off after the vet had seen him, and now I'm working on getting to him to accept taking the bit and trying to restart. Hopefully we can get past the bad experience with the pain issue. The question is, would I be better off starting over or should 
Basil. <laughs> Should I keep um, continue to keep getting on him and working a little bit on his saddle every week? Sky. Um. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I I have found consistency helps. Um, so I think you know starting over in the sense of using some ground training, but getting back into a consistent program. Um, I think the program, a program that works for both of you would be very helpful, um, you know, and, and something that is giving you positive results. And uh, again, the repetition of that positivity. Um, um, but yeah, I, I think a program, I mean, we, we really find the consistency with the younger horses usually leads to the best outcome. Allison? I would go back to groundwork with that horse. Uh, I would probably get him in a rope halter. I would make him pack his saddle a little bit and just say like, dude, you follow me and you move when I move. And when you don't move because you're being a bit of a bulky dick, you're going to move. And whether that means that you drive with your, with your shoulder and you indicate it with position or you use the end of the rope, but this is a horse who's now developed a bad habit. And I hate to tell you, but geldings are bulky little brats. <laughs> so often you do have to say to them, now that you have learned this habit where you said no and lay down on the ground because your teeth hurt, that does not work every day. No one's getting off and no one's telling you you're cute. You move, you yield, you turn what I say turn, and you say thank you at the end. Because right now, I'm sorry that he had a pain issue, but he is a little bit in the, the way of a spoiled child and you are gonna have to lay some very clear boundaries. And if you are not comfortable doing that kind of groundwork, there are a lot of good hands who can help you out. And I don't, I don't know where you're located, obviously, but I would strongly recommend that you spend some time with that horse and really make it clear. Go means go, stop means stop, six feet away from me, and I'm not kidding. I think you should send it to Allison. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. I, I have one um, there, too. <laughs> Emily? Uh, are, are, we, are we done with the questions? I think we have one more. Um, Ariel jumped on late, so she did ask for newbies to groundwork. What would be a good resource, you know, where to start? Um, and so I think probably since she asked that, you guys have answered that a little bit as far as, um, Skylar, if you wouldn't mind just recapping quickly what you do with the roping. Yeah, so um, it's it's like I said, it's a little bit of a mix between like Pirelli work and natural horsemanship, and it's a long, a longer rope line connected to a rope halter, and it puts pressure on the nose. There's no bit, no bridle. Um, sometimes with the younger horses, we will put a saddle on if they're getting used to the stirrups and whatnot. Uh, but it has so much to do with respect and understanding body language and everything else. It was just saying about the last horse. Um, Deborah asked, um, thoughts on keeping the neck long with a five-year-old with big movement who likes to get too short as an evasion of the half halt. Hello. Hi. JJ? I, you know, um, love to ride my horses. You know, at the end of the day, um, we should always work on the vocabulary of the horses. So that's like, there's three dials you should tune every day. One is of long and short frame. The second dial is long and short stride. And the third dial is bending and straightness. And so I definitely feel, you know, to create a balanced, supple um, partner, you know, I do like to ride and make sure my horses do stretch. Um, I certainly, you know, don't want them running down at, like, you know, you don't want the, the wheelbarrow full of rocks, like running down the hill, you know? So, um, you know, I really want to make sure that they're waiting for me and that I can like slow their feet and shift their weight into their hind legs, but yet still allow the neck to be long. Um, you know, he's a little bit, if he's just getting short in the neck. That's a way to cop out from using his core and his, his full top line. Uh, so I would do again, you know, start to introduce, you know, some shoulder in, you know, definitely canter trot, trot canter transitions, 
you know, anything to get the horse waiting for you and, you know, to have that ability to start to bend him in the rib cage so that your legs can start to uh, engage the horse's hind legs. And like, he needs to learn. I always find that's a certain stage, you know, that a lot of times when they're babies, you know, the leg means go forward. And then it also needs to start to uh, mean, I need you to engage, I need you to bend your rib cage, you know, so that's part of the evolution of the education. Um, and so he seems because he just wants to just get tight and short in the neck. You always want to make sure you're concentrating on making from behind the saddle shorter and the neck long, you know, the horse should be a longer horse in front of the saddle, and he should be shorter behind the saddle. So um, yeah, lots of transitions, get him shifted back into his hocks and teach him how to pull his neck out of his back. I, I'm reading a question here, and it's really for Sky. Um, it's handling horses who get balky cross country. Fine, relax, and something crosses his mind, and he starts sucking wind, getting big like he's going to blow. Uh, we do a lot of slow work cross country. So actually a lot of um, different uh, like flat work exercises, even on the hills around our cross country courses, um, using little logs, little fences, little drops, water, um, trot through the water, canter a log, do a simple change, do a transition, do a halt, um, incorporating a lot of flat work into the cross country. I think a lot of horses get out cross country and they just see red. And so you have to make them really uh, find that partnership with you and, and respect you just as much as they do in the ring out in the field. Um, and, and if it's really nerves, uh, the roping over cross country fences, letting the horse um, figure out their instincts without the influence of a rider, you know, let them make mistakes, uh, let them figure out their balance and their speed and their landings and the terrain. And we rope on hills over fences and we rope up and down drops and, and they have to be accountable. Um, so I think that really depends if it's a confidence issue or a rideability respect issue. So my horse, this is kind of, uh, not a training question, but he's had some hives and some issues with hives just the last few days. And I think it might be the gnats. Is there anything I can do for to help with that other than cover him up with, um, cheats and such? Traumera, the poultice of champions it works for everything it's unbelievable yeah. i have come in with those what is it slide bites and it's traumera t-r-a-u-m-e-r-a and you can get it on biostarus.com and it, okay. it's unbelievable it actually i'm allergic to everything um and i had to stack hay the other day and i came in covered in hives from stacking hay I just put that on myself and spent half an hour potentially drinking a G&T &G and felt really good. And, uh, <laughs> and had more fun. I do have fresh mint, so mojitos are. Oh, that's the way to go. Just Can I bump off of that horses. really quick and ask, um, I have a horse that has Cushing's and metabolic and he's older now, he's 21. And he's always been overweight, but now he's starting to lose weight. And I'm trying to figure out what I could give him that would keep him, keep the, you know, keep, keep him, balanced. yeah, balance, keep him from not getting, you know, skinny, but also not having weight problems with the cushions and stuff. He doesn't eat any grass. Um, and he's right now just on a, like a ration balancer with, and I give him tons of different other stuff. Um, the other different kind of stuff might be part of the problem. You know, with Mel I Mel give him, um, we want to keep I give him a five in one, and then I give him flax and magnesium, magnesium and uh, one other good. thing. He gets his pill every day, of course, for his cushions. Beat pulp. Beat pulp. Yes, he's on a percent one pill a day. So I would be it's rechecked every six months. I, I'd increase the protein and the fat. And one of the easiest ways to increase the protein is with some alfalfa pellets. It, I know he we won't, I've done that. He won't eat the alfalfa pellets. Ew. So I know, isn't that silly? let's go with uh, coconut meal, which would be cool. Mm. Coconut meal. Mm -hmm. It's called cool, okay. cool stance. And it will cool give him 20% protein, 10% fat, 25% fiber. Okay. And you'll eat a lot, you know, start with, 
a cup per feeding. Okay. The quickest way to get weight on an older horse is to add a yeast, a live yeast probiotic. What you want to do is increase the digestional fire in the gut. And what happens with older horses, like I'm a perfect example of an older horse. <laughs> <laughs> My digestional fire is not what it used to be. I know. Um, <laughs> you you want to increase the activity in the gut to utilize the food that you're giving him. So okay. I, I would go with BioStars Bio Yeast. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely add some coconut meal. If you want a really, what I call a quick fix, add a good oil, a flax oil, a hemp seed oil, a camel. I used to have a flax oil, but I put that away and put the actual flax seed granite, you know. Yeah, the oil is, you know, because it's so concentrated as fat, it, it's going to go to work faster. Mm. Hmm. Okay. And because he's already getting flax, you might want to put him on hemp seed oil as a cha you know, as a mm -hmm. different fat source or camelina oil. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get a hold of these days on this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. You're welcome. Emily? Um, I think that's it. If anybody has anything else, please. Um, I, I just want to say again, I, I'm so honored to be um, the, uh, I guess I'm the master of ceremonies for Sky and JJ and Allison, um, three horsewomen I admire so much. Thank you for your time tonight. Really appreciate yeah. it. And don't forget Team Tate Academy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.